Welcome back to Combat Mission Cold War and the Between Two Farbards scenario. There are a couple of other playthroughs of this scenario already on YouTube. I'll leave links to the videos by Megalon Jones Slashery and Requin87 down below. But they are both from the US perspective, so I thought it'd be a change of pace to run through this one as the Soviets. It is March 1979. 8th Guards Army is punching forwards for the NATO headquarters at Stuttgart. I have the 3rd Tank Company of the 27th Independent Tank Battalion attached to the 27th Guards Motorized Rifle Division under my command, which has just kicked the Americans off of Bundesstrasse 1. My new mission is to continue attacking west and force the Americans off Bundesstrasse 2, two kilometers away. Very simple. The process for the actual attack is equally simple. This is a company attack, so it's an exercise in going through the battle drill for a company attack according to the doctrine. This relies on mass, and we can broadly break it down into three phases. The first phase is the preparatory phase. As the battle starts, I only have a single tank platoon. This isn't enough to conduct an attack with, so I'm going to have to wait until my other two platoons turn up at the 5 and 15 minute marks respectively. Luckily, I have a relatively safe space to concentrate my armour on the reverse slope behind this large building just outside of my deployment zone. While I'm waiting, I have a reconnaissance platoon in BMPs I can send out to screen my tanks and gather information on the enemy. Plus, I can call in my air support to try and attract them a bit. I have two loggers armed with ATGMs, bombs and cannon circling the battlefield, and although the Americans greet them with shoulder-launched SAMs, one of them gets a missile on target. It's not clear exactly what it's hit, but whatever it is starts the burn. The attacking MiG is found by a red-eye missile in return, but its comrade gets away and sets up for another attack run. By this point, the reconnaissance screen has gotten into position about halfway up the map. From here, the scout teams can dismount and observe the enemy from concealed positions, but getting this far up and getting so close to the woods on either flank and the small cluster of bungalows in the centre has also failed to reveal any forward enemy ATGM teams that could cause significant problems. The scouts catch some fleeting glimpses of American tanks on the edge of the objective area, confirming the briefing's suggestion of M60A2s. The M60A2 Starship is an interesting offshoot in tank design, exchanging the NATO standard high velocity long barreled 105mm gun for a 150mm cannon capable of firing shillelagh anti tank guided missiles as well as heat and high explosive shells. These design choices have consequences. Firstly, the Starship's ammunition relies exclusively on shaped charge warheads for armour penetration. These don't lose effectiveness over distance as they lose energy, in the same way that standard armour piercing or sabo rounds do, so the armour on my T-72s will offer the same amount of protection at any range, and there's no advantage trying to fight a standoff fight at distance here like there might have been against standard M60s. Second, in common with most ATGMs, the Shillelagh missiles fly slower than conventional rounds and require the firing unit to remain still while the gunner guides the missile in order to avoid breaking the control wires. In other words, if engaged by an A2 firing a Shillelagh, the target tank and its comrades should hopefully have some time to spot the launch and put some rounds down range that might neutralize the enemy gunner or at least throw him off and cause him to miss. The Americans do manage to get some hits in early. The company commander of the attached reconnaissance platoon turns up with the first reinforcement wave at the 5 minute mark and sending him out to join his subordinates reveals that the open ground ahead of my position is now covered by at least one starship in a way that it wasn't when I sent the scouts out. The BRM-1 is hit by a shillelagh and destroyed with no survivors while the two T-72s I'd popped up to give overwatch failed to actually see anything. Obviously this isn't ideal, but it does serve to confirm that there's a danger area just out in front. A little later, when trying to spread my tanks out and offer a less attractive target for potential American air support that might be around, a T-72 gets bogged with its side armour exposed. 
A shillelagh quickly sails out from the enemy line and strikes it in the side, taking it out. Nor are the scouts immune. A three-man scout team in one of the center bungalows is singled out by another starship on the left flank and smacked around by a 152mm high explosive shell. The scouts are at least serving their purpose. By now I have good spots on two American tanks and a good idea of where the other three are, assuming that it's a standard five tank platoon. Meaning that when the 15 minute mark comes around I have enough information to cut apart the enemy defense. This is phase two, winning fire superiority. 15 minutes into the battle, my last remaining T-72 platoon arrives and my fire plan kicks in. A platoon of BM-21 multiple rocket launchers targets the center of the American position, deluging it with 122mm high explosive rockets. To complement the rockets, a section of 120mm mortars smokes up the right side of the enemy line. Casualties here are a bonus. The intent of the combined rocket and mortar barrage is to shut down the center and right of the enemy defense by suppressing or obscuring any tanks or ATGM teams out there. This will not only reduce the amount of American fire coming towards my tanks as they advance and shake out into a line, but allow me to concentrate my firepower on isolated fragments of the defense. The final T-72 platoon has arrived on some high ground behind Bundesstrasse 1, where they spot a single M60A2 out on the far left. The long range not only means it takes the T-72s a few shots to get on target, but that APFSDS rounds actually lose enough energy to be defeated by the M60's frontal armour. The Starship is able to tank a few hits. There's no saving it from the brutal arithmetic of 4 to 1 odds, though, and within a minute a 125mm heat round strikes the turret and knocks it out. A similar story plays out on the far right. A single M60A2 is engaged by multiple T-72s at the same time. This starship is luckier. It not only shrugs off a partial penetration, but gets two shillelaghs away. One misses, potentially thanks to the partial pen throwing the gunner off, but he manages to fly the second missile straight into the front of a T-72. Luckily for the T-72, this fails to burn through the thick turret armour. Luckily for the starship, the expanding smoke screen I put down gives it the concealment it needs to reverse away and escape. Those are the kinds of engagements I want though. I want to mass my firepower against isolated sections of a fragmented defense instead of trying to go toe to toe with it, destroying it in detail without giving it a chance to mass its own firepower. It takes a few turns to fully deploy the company, during which time the surviving flogger makes a surprise reappearance, strafing something very flammable in the center of the American position. The red eyes have evidently reloaded though and pluck it out of the sky and return. Another starship appears on the far left, pulling back from a flanking position behind a wood. Immediately outnumbered, it's subject to a hail of fire and although the M60A2 again tanks a few hits thanks to the range and gets a missile away, it doesn't have much chance. Another heat round scoring a partial pen which sets it on fire. The crew bail out and the out-of-control shillelagh crashes into the dirt. With one of the surviving M60A2s definitely in the centre and the other two on the right, that means that I don't need to worry too much about my left now. Better yet, I can exploit the terrain to safely advance under these conditions. The bungalows in the centre are on a slight slope that shields my tanks from the remaining enemy positions. I hadn't counted on US reinforcements though, as I'm bringing my final platoon forward, another T-72 goes up. Two M150 tow vehicles have appeared behind the reverse slope at the back of the map, suddenly rendering the left a serious threat again. Worse, the same rise I'm trying to exploit to close the range to the American defenders on the right without being seen is effectively splitting my armour in this new engagement. While it's true that most of my tanks are safe from the M150s, this is a two-way street and the M150s are equally safe from them. 
ultimately putting two tow vehicles up against three T-72s. Three to two odds are not good enough, especially when advancing against hull down anti-tank missiles and a second T-72 is quickly destroyed. The situation is compounded by me ignoring the proper spacings in order to take advantage of the terrain and a trailing tank runs into the back of the latest boss. Losing speed and time trying to maneuver around the wreck, this third T-72 receives a tow missile as well and grooves up. The solution to this new problem is, of course, mass. The M150s were able to get their hits in thanks to the element of surprise. Now that I know they're there, I can adjust accordingly. After a few minutes of reorganization and shuffling, my remaining eight T-72s roll forward and open a new engagement. One M150 is caught adjusting its position in the rear and is wiped out by a high explosive shell, taking the odds from 4 to 1 to 8 to 1. The second M150 gets two more missiles away, skimming the top of one T-72 and scoring a hit on the frontal armour of another that fails to penetrate, before it's also spotted and violently introduced to a fin round. That's that interruption dealt with and critically dealt with without any interference from the templated remaining three starships. That's a good indicator that I've won the firefight and the battle has shifted into the final phase of closing with and destroying the enemy. This is again an exercise in bringing mass to bear. The Soviets are all about the numbers. The T-72s again shake out into a more coherent line supported by the recomplatoon BMPs. Advancing in the open on the left, one of these spots an M60A2 on the centre right. The starship spots the BMP2 and turns to engage when it's suddenly hit in the front hull. One of the T-72s has also made the spot and fired a sabo round. This manages to penetrate the armour, but the hit location just below the left headlight cluster looks like it hasn't done any significant damage. The A2 reacts starting to reverse away at the same moment the BMP fires off an AT-3 Sager. The gunner immediately loses control though and the missile ploughs into the dirt, leaving the BMP exposed for the starship to return the favour. A shillelagh reaches out and hits the lower hull just in front of the driver, killing him and destroying the vehicle before the A-2 disappears behind its slope. It'll be safe down there for the time being, but the problem for the American defenders is that they can't stop me advancing without peeking over that slope, and I'm pretty sure that two of the surviving M60s are both down there on the Bundesstrasse itself, where they have extremely limited fields of fire. The third is in the centre somewhere, hidden amongst a string of buildings projecting out from the objective area. It's not going to stay hidden for long though. This is World War III. Collateral damage is not even a fleeting concern. A hail of high explosive shells demolish a likely building to reveal the starship, which is swiftly colandered by three T-72s. That seems to leave nothing between my tanks and the Bundesstrasse objective itself, so it's time to advance again. Engaging in a little prophylactic fire in case there are any optimistic US infantrymen holed up in the buildings with light anti-tank weapons, the T-72s roll forward to the edge of the road embankment. Caught at close range by superior numbers, the Americans down on the highway don't stand a chance. Although an infantry team manages to destroy another BMP, the two remaining starships are knocked out in quick succession. That leaves the M113s and infantry borderline defenseless and the Soviet tanks ruthlessly mop up, physically overrunning the Bundesstrasse in short order and forcing a surrender. That, of course, renders the game a Soviet total victory by default, but it's very clear that the Americans are out of the fight after losing basically all of their combat power. Five M60A2s, two M150s, four M113s and four jeeps sit knocked out or burning in the rain alongside 58 dead, 14 wounded and a mere eight survivors. The battle hasn't exactly been bloodless for the Soviets. I've lost four T-72s, two BMP-1s, a BRM-1 and the two floggers as well as 15 dead and two wounded. But the Soviet army is prepared to exchange lives and material for operational speed. 
thanks to the reliance on ingrained battle drills, what's left of this company could easily be folded into another, and the advance can continue. The four T-72 losses are actually quite instructive. One of these was a straightforward error of judgement mixed with bad luck back in my deployment zone. The other three were caught by the M150s and they advanced in decidedly less than ideal circumstances. The tanks in that engagement were isolated from the rest of the company and caught by surprise whilst on the move. I feel that some attached infantry ATGMs in support, perhaps set up in the large four-storey building in the rear where my FO and air controller quickly spotted the two newly arrived tow vehicles, could have nicked that problem in the bud without too much trouble, but that wasn't an option here. Regardless, this was a really good example of how the Soviets can use mass to get the job done. Being able to use the terrain, fire support and smoke to isolate certain areas of the American defence and then destroy those isolated segments with overwhelming mass seems to be the trick. The vital caveat, of course, is that I was playing against the AI, which is never going to be as capable as a human opponent. A human being capable of reading the battle, playing shoot and scoot, and crucially, keeping their force hidden until the right moment and unleashing as much firepower as possible in a coordinated fire ambush, a little taste of which we got with the M150s arriving as reinforcements, would be a very different and a much more difficult prospect. That's all for this video though, hope you all enjoyed this trip to the Fulda Gap and I'll see you in the next one.